Hey folks, what's going on? Today we're gonna to be looking at a really fundamental piece of touch designer knowledge that I find separates the more advanced users from folks who struggle in that intermediate and beginner range. And this all has to do with how pros and advanced users think about the data inside of different families of operators and different kinds of processing pathways that you're using. I'm sure that in some point in time you've seen somebody's project or somebody's workflow and you're like, how did they even think about going from this operator into that operator, changing the family of operators, then doing this kind of processing, and then finally bringing it back to wherever they started or needed it to end. And this really comes down to how those pros understand the data. So I got an example here that we're gonna rebuild, but before we do that, I have a nice diagram that I built a while ago that I always come back to reference. And it's kind of how I and a lot of pros approach the data model inside of Touch Designer. A lot of times folks kind of think that every family of operators, whether it's SOPs or CHOPs or DATs or TOPs, is fundamentally different from all of the other families of operators. Now this can be true in some ways where there are extended kind of data types that only exist in certain types of families of operators, but the vast large majority of data that we work with is actually very similar between the different families of operators. So instead of thinking about, you know, these big silos where all the SOP data can only be processed by SOPs and all the CHOP data must exist inside of CHOPs and TOPs and DATs have their own things, if we start to think about it more in this kind of model, where essentially at the bottom we have Touch Designer's engine, the vast majority of data we deal with, whether it's pixel values, positions in 3D space, signals coming in through chops, or a lot of the times data coming in through DATs, you know, excluding Python, or if you're working with web APIs dealing with strings, but if you're just dealing with number data, which like I said, a lot of time we're just, we're just crunching numbers a lot of time. What we can actually think about is that each one of these families of operators is just a different data structure used to represent that number data. So we can think about SOPs instead of even just being, well, SOPs is 3D data. The better mindset is thinking of SOPs as using 3D workflows and data representations for our numeric data sets. Similarly, when we think about CHOPs, we can think about, instead of thinking about it as purely CHOP data, we can think about it as number data represented in a more traditional audio or signal processing or control signal workflow and family of operations. And finally, when it comes to tops, which are kind of becoming much more used in, whether it's point clouds or LIDAR sensors, it will really become the new kind of data processing headquarters since everything happens on the GPU. Instead of thinking about tops as just images and videos, we can think about it as numeric data represented in a pixel space where we can take advantage of video processing and GPU accelerated workflows. Now, once we start to think about it more in this context, what you're gonna see is that it becomes really easy and intuitive to move the data between the different families of operators. So when we're doing things like moving from SOPs to CHOPs or back, or going from CHOPs to TOPs and back, these kind of motions feel a lot more intuitive because we're just thinking about how can we take this underlying representation of number data and basically move it into the family that's gonna give us the most tools to quickly and easily do our job in the best way that we can, ideally in the way that also has some nice visual representations to it. So this is a really important chart. I think even if you just pause the video here and really just like, you know, zoom in on it, you know, the meme of the guy standing in front of the computer, really deep uh, looking at the picture here. This is really important. And I can kind of show you how this manifests in Touch Designer. So what I'm gonna do here is, is go ahead and just delete everything in my project. And I'm gonna start by making a noise chop. Now in this noise chop, I'm going to go to the channel page and I'm gonna make three channels, X, Y, and Z, separated by a space there just so I have three channels to work with. It'll make it interesting as we're moving through the example. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is start to think, well, what happens if I move this through different families of operators? I think a lot of the time, and this also applies to techniques like chop shuffling, we perceive most options as destructive because that's what we're used to when we're coming from 
whether it's 3D pipelines or video compositing pipelines, once you do an operation, you've kind of committed or changed the data of that operation and you can go back and reference the source, but the source isn't what you have anymore. And as we go through moving data through different families of operators, it's very counterintuitive at the beginning because actually none of the data changes. It just changes its representation. So I have, for example, XYZ channels here. I've got 300 samples of position data that maybe I have in a chop in some form, but maybe I think to myself, hey, you know what would be really great if I could move this into a 3D context and manipulate these with SOPs because maybe there's some nice SOP that I can use. Noise SOP is a fun one, whatever the case may be. I can go ahead and create something like a chop to SOP and drag and drop my noise chop onto that chop parameter and then just make sure my channel scopes are correct. So this is looking for channels TX, TY, TZ by default, but I know my channels are named X, Y, Z. And in this case, it's gonna map them automatically to P0, P1, and P2, which are just kind of technical names for position. That's usually what capital P means in 3D world, it's position. And zero, one, and two correspond with X, Y, Z. So now I've taken this data, this noise data here, represented it in a 3D environment. And if I middle click, I have 300 points of X, Y, Z positions, which basically matches perfectly with the data set I originally had. But I could keep compounding this. I could, for example, maybe have this 3D data and I wanna turn it into a table format. Maybe I wanna save it into an Excel file or a CSV for making a preset system. Maybe I wanna send it through some Python scripts to a web server, whatever the reason is. I could then maybe go ahead and do something like create a SOP to DAT. And I know the names are very confusing. For the first five years of using Touch Designer, you're probably gonna stumble saying chop to SOP, SOP to chop, DAT to chop, top to chop, is a very common situation. Now I have the SOP to DAT here. I'm gonna take my chop to SOP. Oh, this is gonna be a tricky one. I'm gonna take my chop to SOP drag this SOP onto the SOP parameter, ideally not miss, and now I can see that I essentially have that exact same information, just changed its data format. So instead of being signals in a CHOP, instead of being positions in 3D space, now they're essentially columns in a table. And the fun thing is that I can convert these back using something like a DAT to CHOP. And in this case, I can grab this DAT put it in the dat to chop and all I have to do is change a few settings just to let the dat to chop know how is my you know data arranged inside this sop to dat so first thing i usually do is come here and just tell it that you know what i have a header row so my first row is not values it's actually the names of the channels and in this case what i want is i have my p0 column p1 and p2 so i want one channel for each of these three so I'm gonna switch my output here from channel per row, which is making a new channel for every single row. I wanna switch it over to channel per column. And then what I can do is also make sure that I'm selecting the right columns because I don't need my index. I don't need PW or groups or any of that. So I can change my select columns to by index. And I can see the indices of my columns here. So it's really from column one, two, and three. So I can say my start column is one and my end column here is three. Now the final thing is that my first column here is defined as names, which in this case, our first column is actually values. So what I'm gonna do is change my first column to values. And now the real cool thing is that if we were to compare this data from our dat to chop with our original noise, which we can do just by a simple math chop, Hey there, sorry to pause the video, but I wanted to share something with you real quick. Right now, you can get 50% off the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. The HQ Pro is the only comprehensive educational resource and community for touch designer professionals. We've got over 200 hours of video trainings and a private community where Matthew Reagan and myself answer your questions daily. We've also just launched the first mini degree program for interactive tech and immersive media professionals. If that sounds interesting, click the link in the description to learn more about the interactive and immersive HQ Pro and join for 50% off. Remember, offer ends November 29th. I can connect both of those together. 
and then go into the combined chops parameter and subtract them from each other, I'm gonna get fully zeroed out channels because these two data sets, regardless of how many different families of operators I've gone through, this is still exactly the same data. And I think this is really the powerful concept to take away from this video because you're gonna see a lot of pros do this where they might have some positional data in chops and they say, you know what, this would be really fun to play with in SOPs. They dump it into a chop to SOP, create a whole SOP network doing fun stuff, maybe emitting particles. And then at the end, maybe they just switch it back right to chops so that they can go and set it into instancing setups or kind of whatever might be appropriate for that environment. Now the same can also be said for tops. And I think this is even more important as tops become kind of the new standard data workflow pipeline. I know if you've seen uh, videos of our friend Aurelian Paquetta 12, who does amazing work basically with just tops. It's really a shiny, shining example of the power of basically top workflows. And because everything in a top is running on the GPU, it really lets you scale your workloads up to bigger and bigger scales and be able to do more and more with less hardware. That's why you see a lot of particle systems as they become more complex, like the particles GPU inside of the palette, everyone turns to shaders because then they can compute all of the data for those particle systems on the GPU. Now, the great thing about this is it extends to tops as well. And to really any order of doing this, there's no magic behind this order that I've created here. So even just for example, I could go from my chop into a dat format. I could then move my dat into a SOP format. Let's just change some of these parameters so that things show up here. And then I can switch that from a SOP directly to a chop. I could then even take that and go from a chop to a texture using a chop to top. In this case, we just gotta be careful to set our data format because by default it ex is expecting only one channel, the R channel. So in this case, I have to tell it, you know, I have three channels, so I'm gonna need R, G, and B. And you can see here, we have this nice kind of like colorful texture with all of our data in it. But then in the very same way, I can then dump this back into a chop. And all of this is non-destructive doesn't affect my data. It's just giving me the ability to change the representation of the data. And more importantly, giving me a whole new tool set and kind of workflow and ideology behind how I can process that data. Because how we think about processing textures is totally different than how we think about processing SOPs, which is pretty different than how we process DATs, which is pretty different than how we process CHOPs. And being able to move between these different worlds with kind of the same data set that you're working with incredibly powerful tool. So in this case, I know that I'm just using RGB, so I don't even need my A channel here. We can see it's just basically one. I could go ahead and delete that. And I'm hoping that you guessed it. If I put a math chop here and do the same thing again, where I subtract my source and my kind of final top to chop here, I'm gonna get perfectly zeroed out channels. Now, I can't stress how important it is to start thinking about data this way in Touch Designer. It really is kind of that light bulb that goes on uh, in a lot of people's journeys, usually around year two, year three, year four, as you start working on bigger projects and with people with more experience, you're gonna see them do this kind of thing a lot where maybe they have a geometry that they've imported, you know, or maybe you downloaded a, something from TurboSquid and you wanna bring that in and start processing it they might think to themselves, you know what, They're, this is such a dense model, I can't really do this with SOPs, but don't worry, I can take all of my point positions, move them over into TOPS via CHOPS, process everything there efficiently with a couple of different TOPS, and then eventually spin the process back and then reapply that point data back to the 3D model. And these are what really start to open up your touch designer experience. Now, we'll probably make more videos about shuffling as well, because shuffling is a very similar concept. We have a couple blog posts about it, where it's this idea of data rearrangement and data restructuring, uh, especially if you're working with DMX, ArtNet, lighting fixtures, shuffling is gonna be something that you have to do a lot, so we'll make some more videos about that. But in the meantime, even just practicing this workflow, you know, bring in a data source in one family, 
toss it into another family, process it a bunch, and then bring it back to your source family, this is really gonna start to level up your game and really change the way you approach problems in Touch Designer. Hey folks, thanks for watching. As I mentioned earlier, you can get 50% off the interactive and immersive HQ Pro right now. The HQ Pro is the only comprehensive educational resource and community for touch designer, immersive design, and creative technology professionals. We've got over 200 hours of video trainings, a private community where Matthew Reagan and myself answer your questions daily, as well as the first professional certification program for touch designer users. We've also just launched the first mini degree program for the interactive tech and immersive media industries. If that sounds interesting, click the link in the description to learn more about the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. 